Hello and welcome to Tuesdays from Morsi, where we share insights from great thinkers. Today, I'm excited to be joined by Helene Knapp, the founder of City Row and the author of the new book, Making Waves. Helene, thanks for coming on the show today. Thanks for having me. Excited to be here. I want to start this episode with an excerpt from your book. This is not your typical hero's journey. This isn't a rainbows and butterflies fairy tale. This is the real raw and gritty story that is unfortunately more like the untold stories of most founders. So if you choose this path, admire this path, or in some way are a part of this path, know you're not alone in your loneliness, the heartbreak and the true insanity it is to take and embark on this startup journey. What comes to mind to you when you hear your own words? I think that's a great paragraph. I'm going to be honest. Um, I think that's a great uh, recap of the entire ethos of the why behind this book. Um, I think it was a great paragraph that you pulled out. I'm like, I think that's towards the end, but it also mirrors a little bit of what I think is part of the author's note. And Mm -hmm. that, that kind of takes it home. That's what this is about. Let's tell a different story, but one that is more common and let's hopefully allow people to feel more seen. I want to share a little bit about the City Row story. In 2021, TechCrunch released that City Row raised $12 million for connected rowing machines and studios. This was at about at the same time where a competitor called Ergata raised $30 million at a $250 million valuation. The space was on fire. But that wasn't the beginning of the story. You started City Row in 2014. Can you talk a little bit about what led up to that 2021 announcement? Yeah, I mean, that was definitely not the beginning of the City Row story. The City Row story started really in 2012, 2013 with a a personal injury that I had. I was working in tech. Like I was an account manager, a salesperson, and I just, I was a consumer of boutique fitness and it was super fun, but I found myself with an injury and it really forced me to look at what the offerings were in the market. And what was quickly apparent is that there weren't enough offerings that were not just kind of the sexy, cool thing, but also were intelligently designed. And I've had a real passion for thinking that intelligently designed movement was going to be part of the future. So I decided to be a pioneer there. And um, City were launched in 2014 as brick and mortar. We opened a bunch more location. We franchised nationally, but also decided to bet very early on digital because I came from the tech world and so did my co-founder. And so we saw the early numbers of Peloton and decided to bet on this category in 2017. So four years before the pandemic hit, or before we raised a lot of money, we had already put a lot of energy and resources against the digital at home connected space. And so when COVID hit in 2020, we not only had a really, really huge footprint on the franchise infrastructure nationally, but we already had a product in market digitally. So all of a sudden you have these companies trying to race into there, into this market of connected at home. We were already there, but we were taking our time because I believed in actually understanding what the consumer wanted, making decisions based off of their reactions and their engagement. And so overnight we were thrust into being a, you know, a cornerstone of this industry. And so uh, about you know 12 months later, we were finally in a position to take on a significant amount of capital and Peloton was at an $8 billion market cap. So anyone and everyone was trying to throw money at anything that could even just touch that sun, you know? Can you speak a little bit? I've never heard that term intelligently designed fitness. What does that mean to you? It means a workout that is designed with the general population in mind. And spoiler alert, Adam, we are not uh, athletes for the most part. Um, We are people that like to move our bodies, um, but we need to prepare our bodies to do work. And it's very easy to make a workout hard. Give me 50 burps, right? Totally. Very hard to make a workout challenging. And what I mean by that is that, you know, let's think about something a little bit different. This is an intelligently designed way to think about it. Okay, Adam, we're going to do, you know, every minute on the minute, we're going to do push-ups, right? You might give me 25 push-ups in standard form, and I might give you eight push-ups on my knees. And then we can each do one more rep next time, right? So we can kind of scale a workout to any fitness level. And the rower is very inherently scalable to all fitness levels. So we wanted this workout to be scalable. We also wanted to make sure that every movement that we were asking people to, you know, push their bodies into was intelligently designed. That means you're not going to be doing, you know, eight movements that replicate a deadlift because by the way, rowing is a deadlift, right? So it means pairing workouts to like and different movements together that are complementary 
it means doing mobility work and telling you that it's core work. People don't like to stretch, um, but they love to work their core. And so by intelligently designed, that's kind of what we mean is we're going to feed you broccoli, but we're going to put some cheese on it and tell you that it was, you know, also, you know, it's, it's maybe it's fried. Yeah, no, that really resonates with me. I, I noticed the same thing in a lot of fitness is like, it's a lot of them I feel are hard more than they're impactful. Yes. We want you to be, feel really good, not feel really sore in a bad way. Fast forward. So you guys are growing, you're in the right place at the right time to take over the digital fitness boom. Fast forward to this year, Bloomberg released that Water Rower acquires startup rival City Row after pandemic fitness boom. What happened between 2021 and the 2024 acquisition? How much time do we actually have here? Um, I'll give you the cliff notes on that. <laughs> so um, we raised a ton of money at the peak of um, the connected fitness boom. We started executing against it just like everybody else, right? So you have to picture where we are in 2021. We've already gone through one COVID holiday. And that holiday, everybody wanted connected fitness. Come 2021, you still got a good amount of people that are ready to buy their at-home fitness equipment, but it's not nearly what it was in 2020 because we already had pulled forward so much demand. And what I mean by that is in the early days of COVID, in the first 12 to 16 months, anyone and everyone that was ever going to consider buying a piece of at-home fitness equipment bought it as quickly as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. Everybody did. So you come around to holiday 2021 and you have you have like appetite, but it's a fraction of what it was in 2020. It's still bigger than what it was in 2019, right? Because this is pre-COVID, this is pre-at-home consumer adoption, but so much money was being pushed into marketing, not just for fitness, but for any kind of CPG product, that all of a sudden nobody could acquire customers in 2021. So holiday sales were a shit show, not just for City Row, but for everybody. And that's when you look at what the Peloton, you know, they had a really dumpster fire P&L in January of 2022. Yeah. That was everybody. That was every single CPG product, by the way. And every single person had the exact same story. You had a couple that like kind of, you know, were a little scrappier and didn't throw all their money into marketing, but no one could acquire customers. We were no different. And so over the entire year of 2022, we tried to think about different ways to be a little bit scrappier with the business, drive to profitability, not rely so much on these digital channels for sales. And the reality was there just wasn't a market for people to buy new pieces of fitness equipment. At the same time, our city road studios were not coming back in the same way that we'd anticipated. A little yep. bit of COVID anxiety. These studios were brand new, so they didn't have an install base that was hungry to come back. And so we were struggling quite a bit. We decided to, we did some layoffs. We decided to shut down the franchise infrastructure as, as best we could to preserve capital. And then we decided to try and do a distribution deal with Water Rower Manufacturer. And ultimately it was a really smart move, but there wasn't really enough time to get it to full execution before the clock kind of ran out on the, the City Row, I would say, standalone business. And so we ultimately decided to transact with them and have them kind of run operations from here on out. You talk about this in the book, but like, what was it like for you to be growing like crazy, but still just getting by? Like you grew to 65 franchise locations. You were in position for the digital home fitness. What was that like for you? And I'm still angry. Like this, this still a fucking great idea, just for the record. Um, yeah. I think that it, it, it was a mind fuck because I'm like, I don't understand, right? I'm, I'm a pretty rational person, similar to mm -hmm. how I felt when I was like, I am working out five to six days a week and I should be in the best shape of my life, not wearing a back brace because I'm injured. Right. So that kind of like these things don't equate was similar to how I felt about City Row at that time. And what was so frustrating is that I knew that we had everything going for us, but there were some things that made it a little bit hard for City Row to acquire to, you know, attract the right capital. And I talk about this a lot, but in retrospect, man, straddling brick and mortar and franchise and digital, like we didn't fit anyone's basic thesis. We just didn't. It doesn't matter if it was the right solution for the end consumer and eventually everyone will get there. It was a little bit too early for most investors. And so it was really frustrating. It's still frustrating. And I'm not sure I'll ever get over it. Yeah. By the way, we, with that uh, 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 water rower acquisition, how did you get this book out in the same year? 
Um, it's a great question. I'm actually not sure. No. Um, so I had written the book a lot during COVID and mm. it was supposed to be a very different strategy for the book. It was initially supposed to be like a start of a series A story that I wanted to tell before we exited, because I think a lot happens in, you know, the time frame from like a big raise to an exit. And I kind of knew that things could go south. Or like I could kind of hate it at the end of the day. And I wanted to tell the story beforehand. And then in 2022, I was pitching, I had an agent, we had a, we had a proposal out and we were pitching publishers and I pulled it and I said, guys, this is a dark book. I was like, we have to change the strategy entirely. And so we changed the strategy entirely and actually sold the kind of new concept in early 23. And the manuscript was due in the summer of 23. And the business had still not sold, but I could kind of like start to feel like what the ending was going to be like. So I was able to write almost like call it 90% of the manuscript by July 31st of last year when it was due. And then I got mm -hmm. edits back in November and they were like, it's, it has to be final, final December 15th. And so I wrote the ending with an assumption of what was going to happen. And then I'm not going to give anything away because everyone should go read the book or listen to the book. I actually, I did the audible, so it's really good, but it, there's a crazy twist at the end. And so in February, I had to email my publisher and be like, Hey guys, um, I know that we submitted the final manuscript and you told me I can't make any more changes, but I have a material update. <laughs> they were like, you can change two pages. So that's how it got out is because it was basically already written. Yeah. Okay. Understood. And it kind of sounds like there was a little bit of a wind down and it just took, and this shouldn't be news, but you know, the water rower acquisition isn't as big and exciting as it was. It was kind of just, they took the operations from here. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, we, we did, you'll, you'll read, I mean, hopefully you'll read about it. We ran a full yeah. M&A process, um, yep. but the entire industry is fucked. It still is. Yeah. Like there's totally the, the entire thing needs to basically write itself into what appropriate growth is. And that's yeah. takes some time. And so we tried to run an M&A process and we did. Um, but then at the end of the day, the potential acquirer had their own shit going on. And so Water River was a longstanding partner of ours. Frankly, everything happens for a reason. I couldn't be happier that that's the final resting place for the brand because they should own this and they should grow it and they will. Yeah, it was just, I, I, I can't remember the exact headline, but I saw them make an announcement about City Row uh, just the other day, I'll have to find it and share it in the show notes. Um, it's really rare that we share and celebrate a story that features a rise and fall of a company. Why was it so important for you to tell your story in making waves? The story needs to be told more. And I'm not saying that every story of a quote unquote failure on paper needs to be told, but in a lot of ways, like this was an amazing journey. We created something incredible. I stand behind that. This is a product that should exist in the market. And because of what happened during COVID, this company no longer exists in the way that it should. And that's okay. I've made, I've made peace with it personally, but it was an unbelievable ride. It was an unbelievable story. And there are so many more stories like this out there for companies and founders who paved the way, who, you know, charted new paths, who made their own waves and who for, for some reason or another ended up needing to part ways with the business. And I refuse to acknowledge that, you know, City Row, even though it might be not perfect on paper, it was still an unbelievable adventure and it was 10 years of my life and many others. And so I think that this story needs to be told. Also the work that goes into building and scaling a company is one thing. The work that it takes to unwind a company, that's a whole nother thing. And so you talk about like the rise, that's one thing that people, a lot of people that like see success, they get that. You have to mm -hmm. unwind a company. That's a whole nother series of experiences. And so I want people to know what it's like. And they seem to like it. <laughs> no, I, I really enjoyed it too. I mean, reading from negotiating the initial leases or even coming up for the money for the initial concept, the whole thing seemed stressful as hell, but did it ever feel fun? Yeah, it totally. It did? It did. I. I talk about this a little and again, like I don't want to give it away, but I'm so grateful that I had people in my 
orbit who had built companies ahead of me. And I kind of always knew that something would happen and I might not love the brand. And so I kind of went in with that and it allowed me to celebrate a lot of moments along the way, even if I didn't really want to. But Mm -hmm. we always took a day to play kickball. We always celebrated. We had a fancy dinner every once in a while. We drank mimosas sometimes. Like, yes, I was really stressed all the time and I probably should have been a little bit more, you know, uh, reflective and proud in the moment. But I also just, not sure founders can do that. Like, I think we can consciously Probably. hear that. I mean, be like, yeah, no, I'm definitely proud of myself. And on our inside, we're like, fuck that. I have so much work to do. But that is how a founder is. And I think that that's also why I wanted to put this into real words is that even if they can't totally enjoy the party, still have the party. Because it's not only for you, you need to do that for your team as a leader. And to be the person that's like, okay, I might, I might want to start working on this because we just raise a lot of money. But as a team and as a culture, we can't just hustle. We also need to recognize and celebrate. You mentioned earlier the fitting people's theses and how there's so much more to build a company, especially when you're navigating the investor environments and such. Did you ever feel that there was undue pressure to grow and expand? 100%. Yeah. You got on the city road, got on the treadmill. We got on the treadmill and I talk about how we got on the treadmill. We got on the highway and like the fucking car was not ready. Um, but we still had to go hundred miles an hour. And yeah. I think that again, no company is really ready for that kind of influx of capital. Like nobody is. Um, I thought we were right. I'd seen a million companies do it. I've been a part of it, like scalable companies, but like, it takes time to institute change. And that was a huge, huge, huge learning curve. And we didn't have enough time to do it. So um, yeah, we got on the highway and we got schooled. Um, Every company kind of has to have their own growing pains. I thought maybe we'd be different, but turns out we weren't. (laughs) Yeah, a lot of companies' stories are very similar. And it's interesting you alluded to also the fact that I think the model for startups is changing. And a lot of startups are prioritizing smaller scale profitability to hopefully avoid that treadmill. Because once you get on, it's basically impossible to get off. I also think that macroeconomics have changed in the space wherein we were in a really frothy environment for about eight, 10 years. And then all of a sudden we're not. But I actually think that's more exciting because I think this is where you actually see innovative founders and creative ideas and you know, I'm a part of a really cool company now that my, my friend started called Loop and Tie, and it's a choice-based gifting program. And mm. despite what was going on around her, like Sarah always held firm on what this company should be, and that is driving towards profitability. And at the end of the day, that's going to win. And I think that that's sexy right now. It probably should have always been sexy, but, you know, when the power kind of turns to investors and they have more money and they have to deploy it, like all of a sudden things get wild. And so I love this. I love this time. Yeah, it's exciting. How would you summarize the key lessons you learned during the 10, ro- 10 years building and winding down City Row? So many. I mean, it's definitely, it's definitely just total gratitude for the entire journey and the process. And to be a little less hard on myself, for sure. I think a lot of people need to be less hard on themselves, especially builders and founders. And I think one of the things that I want to really drive home, and part of the reason I wrote Making Waves was the learning that I had that I didn't have to be so alone and that asking for help is incredibly important, whether that's actually asking for tactical help or asking for someone's ear just to vent and to be heard and to be listened to and to even be held, like that's really important for somebody that's navigating like new uncharted paths forward. And so I wanna normalize the support that founders and builders need because it took me a really long time to figure that out and ultimately it was forced on me. Had I been a little bit more vulnerable earlier on, I think it would have been easier for me. Yeah, you're hitting on two things that I'm completely obsessed with right now. One is self-kindness, because I believe it's one of the biggest accelerators for, I call it emotional, spiritual growth, but other people just call it personal growth and also fulfillment. And then the power of asking for help. I had a guest uh, last fall that wrote a book called, 
almanac of being. And she, one of her questions she poses in the book is, what would you do if you couldn't fail? And one of the things that came up for me is ask more for help. There's some relationship between failure and not wanting to ask for help that I think we need to really stop. Well, I think we think failure, we think asking for help is a failure because it means we can't do it on our own. Meanwhile, I was talking today to an investor of mine who you know, still wants to invest in literally anything I touch, even though I lost all this money. And um, I was like, yeah, and I'm just like really not good at that. And he's just like, that's like my favorite part about you. It's like, there's so much power in saying what you don't know. And the second people realize that, I mean, yeah, it's it's so powerful. People love it. Smart people love it. Yeah. I've definitely seen that as well. I mean, there's just a humility. A, a lot of my guests have talked about the power of not knowing. And when we don't know, that's when we're actually at our best. Mm -hmm. We're forced to innovate. We're forced to iterate. We're forced to ask for help. And that's actually when we're at our best and are in our best posture. Okay. Is there anything like when you look back and it's like everything does happen for a reason, I believe, and there's a lesson in every opportunity, but is there anything you would, if you were coaching yourself that you would have done differently? Oh yeah. I would have been a lot more vulnerable with everyone. Um, whether it's an investor, whether it's a board member, you know, I think I was always afraid to share all the negative all the time, but that's actually really where I needed support in either a reframe that it actually wasn't negative or two advice on how to move through. And people do want to be helpful. That's the other piece of this is that I don't love it when one of my, you know, founders or friends who's running a company calls me like on the brink of tears, but I appreciate that, appreciate that they want to hear what I have to say. And I would say a hundred percent of the time we leave the call and they're feeling better. That is a great feeling. That is a great feeling for me. Selfishly. I love being somebody that can be helpful. And so I wish that I had the, um, the confidence to do that more and earlier in the process, because I think I would have realized that I probably needed to bring someone in to run some of the investment stuff alongside me, just because given the nature of the complexity, what we were doing, I, I mean, it was, it was insane to think that I was going to go figure out how to raise money for a concept that straddled all these different verticals. Like it, it was like a monstrosity. Um, so a lot of a lot of things I might have done differently, but at the end of the day, like I'll probably think about that for the rest of my life, and it's probably not going to get me anywhere. Well, there's a a saying from Mark Twain that's the man who grabs the cat by his tail can learn something he could learn no other way. There's a depth to the lived experience that's extremely powerful that can't be learned any other way. Wow, that's good. Because it's, it's exactly like what you're describing. Like I experienced the same thing. You hear these stories of these companies and these founders and things that happen to them. And everyone thinks it's never going to happen to them. Or I would never do that. And then you get put in these real world scenarios. And to have the firsthand experience, I mean, that's perspective and wisdom. Completely agree. You know, you tell many stories that go back to youth, whether at camp or in college, some about imposter syndrome or self-doubt. Like, how do you see these some of these stories as a through line to your experience being a founder? I, I like to think they're an exact mirror to some degree of the feeling of not being good enough. Like, can we can we do that? Can we can I do it? Probably not. Right. But I'm going to I'm going to try anyway. And I'm. Mm -hmm. I think I, it's fun for me to think back to the person I was when I was really little and the the shyness that emerged for me in my adolescence and how that really um, put like a bit of a cloud over my true identity. And it's been interesting to see how the City Road journey kind of brought me back to, I would say, let's call it peak Helene in a lot of ways, but with the in-depth learnings of having tried and failed, whether that's micro things within city row or within life. And it's, uh, I think we all struggle with the same things. That's kind of what I've been hearing once this story went out there is that like, my story is not that different from anybody else's. I was just maybe one of the first to really tell you it all and be very, very raw and vulnerable because at this point, like, Sorry, Adam, but like really hard to scare me. <laughs> you know, it's really hard to like, I'm a deeply sensitive creature, but like it's, I'm like, never scared in business. Like I have people come to me all the time with like, you know, mission critical problems. And I'm just like, I understand you think that this, 
you know, liquidity ratio is an issue or this investor being angry is a problem, but like, it's just not like, let's walk it, let's walk it out. You know what I mean? Like these are just not big deals. And so it's very hard to like shake me these days. And so I've figured if I can be extra vulnerable and be vulnerable for me in a new way and help people, let's go. Yeah. One of the shifts I thought was really interesting that you made from early in the city road days to later is your view on asking people to invest. Yeah. It was almost like you didn't believe it. Yeah. And the shift was a, that people want to be supportive. Can you talk a little bit about that shift? Oh my God. Yes. It's such a good one. And this comes from confidence and I'm, if I'm mad at Helene in 2013, 2014, it's this one thing. And I, I didn't know any better, but I thought in the early days, like people, I was asking them for money, like kind of for me. And that was a really weird thing. Like I hated that. I hated that I had to talk about money at people. And so I was like, hey, will you please invest in this weird thing called City Row? And they all said yes, which is also strange, but they were all my former bosses or, you know, my uncle or my grandma. So they knew me enough. And then eventually, and this is how I feel now. And this is like, what gets me excited when I join companies is when people are like, you want to be a part of this? Let me help you grow your money 10x. And this is why I think people still want to invest behind whatever I'm doing, because I'm going to make sure that it's a fucking win, right? So if you have that kind of energy, people want to rally behind you and people don't want to miss the boat. And so that is actually the right energy. And so many people don't get it right, particularly women. And this is something I'm very passionate about because women are a little bit more like we're, we hedge we hedge sometimes, right? Because we want to protect everyone. A lot of people are like, generally, I'm generalizing greatly here. We want to protect the den. It's our energy to protect the den. I am someone that would rather under promise and over deliver. That doesn't work in fundraising, by the way, at all. Like you can't have that energy. And so it's been really fun for me to be like, okay, we're starting a new company. And this is, you know, my, my friend and I, like he started something I've been in with him since the, since day one, it's in the healthcare AI comp space. And I feel so fucking strongly that this company is going to deliver that investment conversations are very different because it's like, Hey, do you want it now? We have some legacy terms. Like I'd love to give it to you. If you don't want it, no problem. Right. Because there's also this element of FOMO. And if you don't want in, then I don't really want you either. Mm -hmm. And I also would be a lot more particular about who I let in. People like just think they need to get money in quickly. The worst thing you can do is let in the wrong person. So you better interview the fuck out of them. Yeah, I mean, there's people that have tremendous reputations for being helpful in the early days, not being helpful in the middle, and then helpful in quotes as they take over the company with extremely advantageous terms. We mentioned um, some stories you tell in City Row and then before. What was it like for you to go back and relive some of these things in the process of writing the book? It was hard. It was really hard. Um... I constantly, I can remember the note that my like editor and ghostwriter would constantly say, is like, well, how did you feel? Like, how do you feel? Like, I want you to elaborate on how you felt at this moment. And I was just like, I am exhausted. I'm having so many feels. So, I mean, listen, the going back and telling the stories from childhood, that was one thing. And we did that, you know, a while ago and it was like, okay, and hard to process, like, and just like, you know, some of the stories are kind of icky and I thought it was important to tell the icky stories. Some of them are kind of funny, like the jet skiing story is just fucking hilarious. And so we had a good time telling those stories. And the early days of City Road, that story, I'm just so grateful to have that memorialized because I've been telling that story orally for literally a decade. I think the harder part for me was the second half of this book, which, you know, the way that this is framed is like we have a couple chapters on framing who I am. The building of City Row is actually a pretty tight piece of this story. We focus a lot more on the reality of the wind down from the real the moment we realized that things weren't going well and how that felt. That part was very challenging to write. It was also, I wrote it at a time where I knew the company was coming to an end. So it was very emotional, but I will say it was also incredibly cathartic for me. And I'm, I'm so glad with the timeline that ended up happening because I got to process my feelings in real time through writing. And I learned that it, that's a way that I do cope with things. And by putting language towards these feelings, it really helped me 
get crisp on how I felt, but also move through it. And figuring out what the ending was going to be was also very hard because I was like, how do I end this book? I want this book to be inspiring. Like, how do I end this not so great ending with something that's actually very positive? And I think we got there. Yeah, two ones that stand out to me is I loved in the early days of City Row where you were getting your friends to work the front <laughs> yeah. desk and you walk up there and they're drinking mimosas Emily. and I can just kind of feel the balance of like probably being like so stressed. Like I cannot have these people drinking mimosas to at least they're having a good time and we're all having a good time. Let's have the party. Yeah. Figuratively in this case. And I'm not paying them. <laughs> Yeah. The other one was uh, the day in a life when you go through your timeline. I mean, you can, I mean, I just know what that feeling is like. And I think readers uh, everywhere will know what that like. And I, I think you really captured your emotional state and also the external demands that you were going through. Thank you. Yeah. Chapter seven, a really beautiful way. definitely my favorite chapter. I can still picture like the moment with my ghostwriter when we came up with that concept and I, I love it. I still love it. I think the other part that was really interesting for me to process and relive was actually recording the audio because I had to mm. read every single word out loud with intonation. <laughs> and it was a wild experience. I'd never done that before. I had to basically mandate that I was going to read the book. They didn't want me to read the book. And I was like, this is my fucking memoir. I'll be reading the book. Thank you. Um, and so that was actually a little bit harder than I thought from an emotional perspective because I had to relive the ending like the week of book launch. And I was like, I'm trying to put this behind me. <laughs> so I would yeah. say that reading the audio was a little bit emotional and a little bit more emotional than I thought. Some chapter 11 was so fun to read. I'm sure. Um, what are, you know, you're using these stories and these lessons to help other founders and other companies. What are you, the things that you see most common where you're helping? Just like lack of confidence. And it, it can be a lack of confidence or a perceived lack of confidence based off of the language and the way people carry themselves or interact. I also think that people, you know, a lot of people are just that, that lack of confidence comes through in over explaining and talking too much. There's so much power in silence. And I think you probably get that because you run a sales organization. And so in sales, you need to have that succinct, powerful ability to communicate. So many people don't have that. And I think it comes from a lack of confidence. I, I love just like dropping the mic and being like, okay, I'm not uncomfortable now. Sandler, David Sandler would say your job as a salesperson is to get information and not give information. And then I'm always thinking about how can you say what you want to say, think about what you want to say, say it, and then get out and leave it. Yep. A lot of people don't have that. So that's a, that's a confidence thing I see everywhere again, particularly with women. Um, mm -hmm. And then just like, there's some general fear out there. I think a lot of people have some fear coming out of COVID, whatever that might be, but you really can't enter building, growing, scaling a business with any kind of fear. I've done it. It's just not fun. You got to find a way to like, leave it at the door. What do you need to hear right now is a phrase that I say often. Like, what do you need to hear right now just to move, move forward on this? Let's think about this in two months. What are people, what are some things people say when they're asked, what do you need to hear? They probably need to hear that it's okay. Or they need to yeah. hear that there's a plan and it's going to work. But it kind of goes back to the fundamentals. Of like when you have a thousand priorities, you have no priorities. And anyone who's running or managing a company or a team or a division if you are not heads down focused and you are executing with your blinders on, you will have to work 100 hours a week. And I very much believe that if you can kind of put things to the side and plow without overthinking things, we're talking about a 30 hour work week here. Yeah, if you can write, work on the right things. And so I like to help people focus on the right things because so many people are just not like I, I have a, a company that I do consulting with and a lot of my work is honestly around weekly prioritization, which to me, I'm just like, how are people not doing this? But the second we got the team working, 
with a plan and execution and accountability, they're flying. There just wasn't accountability on priorities. And people just like sometimes need a little bit of help with that. Yeah, it's helpful to have the accountability. And I think a lot of high performers are just used to tackling the thing right in front of them. And they don't realize, and I think you you learn this as you get higher up in leadership, that you need space to create. Space and capacity to create, because that's when you're going to be at your best. And sometimes that might not mean doing something you're excellent at, but you're putting that aside so you can have the space. Totally. Yeah, we got we to gotta juggle, but you got to make sure you're juggling on the right things first. I want to um, end our time sharing a poem that was shared to me by a, a guy named Dr. Patrick Murphy. He was one of my earliest guests on this show. He's the entrepreneurship professor formerly at DePaul and now at University of Alabama, Birmingham. He wrote a book that compared entrepreneurship to the age of discovery, okay. specifically Columbus, John Cabot, uh, and some other folks. And it's about Portuguese seafaring culture, and it alludes to what you have been talking about, about how hard it is to be in this arena. So it's called, um, I think it's just called Portuguese Seafaring Poem. It might be called Oh Salty Sea, but I think it really captures the story you tell in Making Waves. And it's a seafaring poem, uh, and it ties to a book that has a water reference, and obviously rowing is water, so it's really fun. O oh, salty sea, so much of whose salt is Portugal's tears. All the mothers who had to weep for us to cross you. All the sons who prayed in vain. All the brides to be who never were married for you to be ours, O oh, sea. Was it worth doing? Everything's worth doing if the soul of the doer isn't small. Whoever would go beyond the cape must go beyond sorrow. God placed danger in the abyss in the sea, but he also made it heaven's mirror. Wow. I like that. You got to send that to me. Yeah, I will. Any, any reflections on, on that salty poem and how it relates sea. to this book? The salty sea. What's... Yeah. I mean, going beyond sorrow. I really like um, God placed danger and abyss in the sea, but he also made it heaven's mirror. And you made a reference earlier that I thought was really cool about the stories from your youth and the mirror in the through line. And I think sometimes we have these lessons that will continue to be presented with until we transcend them. Ooh. All right. Food for thought for me. I, I can put Yeah, one of my one of my mentors says, if you want to predict the future, pay really close attention to what you're attached to. Because those are the areas you'll likely have to learn the lessons. Oh God. I don't know if I want to hear it's it's awesome. But you've learned you've learned a lot of lessons. Yeah. Um before I let you go, you know, you've learned and experienced so much in a short amount of time, the rise and fall of a company, the release of your first book. In so many ways, you're just getting started. What's the best way for people to keep up with you? Email me. Um, it's just Helena, Helena, I'm also I'm on LinkedIn. I'm on Instagram. And so I have a newsletter. You can get more on my website, Helena, Cool. We'll have links to helenenapp.com in the show notes. But Helene, thank you so much for sharing your story and coming on the show. Thanks for having me, Adam. This was fun. Thank you for listening to Tuesday's Morrissey. That conversation was with Helene Knapp. Helene was the founder and CEO of City Row, as well as the author of the new book, Making Waves. What I enjoyed about the episode was Helene's willingness to tell her story about the rise and fall of her company and what we can learn from that story to change the way we talk about events that don't go the, the way we want to and the power of asking for help. If you enjoyed the episode, share it with a friend and we'll see you here soon. Thanks.